My name is Bill Hogan, and I'm a longtime participant in the Energy Policy Seminar. Um, I'm not the chair of the seminar this year. Uh, Joe Aldi is, but he asked me to serve as the moderator today so I can keep him under control, So, uh, yeah, which I will uh, do my best. Um, and uh, we had a very interesting uh, meeting in the evening last week where Joe, amongst other people, were talking about all the recent legislation on clean energy and so on. And uh, I made the observation that I recall back uh, being of an, a certain age uh, back in, the, uh, in 1992 when the Energy Policy Act passed. And when we came out of that long conversation, which had gone on for a decade or four before that, um, everybody sort of realized that, wow, this is gonna change everything. Uh, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen uh, and, and all kinds of things then uh, developed, which were not expected, but which were very important. And some of those debates continue through today. And I have a feeling a little bit like the, uh, what's it called, the Inflation Reduction Act, which of course is all about inflation and how to manage macroeconomic policy and so on. And there's a couple of sentences about clean energy and associated in it. Um, and it's gonna be a very similar kind of uh, uh, thing where we, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, but one of the things that we should be doing uh, in this process is trying to improve on our evaluation of the steps that we're taking. Uh, Joe, who's a professor here at Harvard and a distinguished research participant in more organizations than I can keep track of, um, um, is, uh, has a very interesting paper on this subject which draws on his experience in Washington as well as uh, reading through the literature. So he is gonna be talking us to, to us today about these um, uh, evaluation uh, lessons and the evaluation challenges. He's gonna give a, some preliminary remarks and then we're gonna to turn to a, a Q&A um, uh, process. Uh, there will be a microphone available to pass around amongst people because we're trying to do this hybrid situation. And if you're not speaking into the microphone, if you're not speaking into the microphone, the people over in here can't hear you. Uh, so we have to uh, pass around a microphone, which is a little bit of annoying, but I hope you can all be uh, accommodating to that change. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Joe Aldi. Thank you, Bill. Of course, the challenge is the mic is too low for Bill and too high for me. Uh, it's a thrill having Bill here since he chaired and hosted this seminar series for a number of years. And in fact, until just recently served as the chair. And back in fall of 2019, he handed the reins of the seminar series over to me. So um, it's also through having Bill here because Bill's one of the main reasons why I came to the Kennedy School. He chaired the recruiting committee that brought me here back made me an offer back in 2008. Uh, and then after I spent a little bit of time in Washington in the beginning of the Obama administration, then I joined the faculty here in 2011. So it's, it's great to have uh, Bill here uh, trying to keep me under control and keep me in check. So, uh, you know, one of the things, of course, when you take over the reins of the seminar series, you have some discretion on who you invite. Uh, and sometimes that means you can invite yourself to the seminar. And the reason why I wanted to do this is in part because, as Bill noted, I have a, a, a recent working paper um, that it serves as the basis for much of what I'm going to say here today. But you know, the, the real reason why I wanted to give this talk about the Inflation Reduction Act is because we're going to have a number of speakers over the course of this semester who are going to touch on various aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, starting with Cal, Carl Hausker of World Resources Institute next week. Uh, we'll do sort of a deep dive into key climate provisions of the law. Uh, we'll have Sarah Ladislaw with Rocky Mountain Institute uh, talk some about both IRA and, and what it means as we look forward on U.S. energy and climate policy. Uh, to look at some of the oil and gas provisions, part of that sort of last minute compromise to get the bill through the Senate. We'll have Brian Prest of Resources for the Future. And we'll also have John Larson of Rodian Group, who did a lot of the sort of quick turnaround modeling that has informed much of the policy of it, debate about what we called Build Back Better a year ago or what we call the perhaps not quite rightly named Inflation Reduction Act now. Uh, so, so with that as sort of a, a preamble, um, let me sort of note that this is, you know, originally some work that we were thinking about in the context of Build Back Better, that bill that passed the House in 2021. It's uh, what I'll be speaking from is from a working paper uh, that I issued last month, 
uh, that was supported by uh, financially by the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, they thought it was really important to try to bring more rigorous thinking to how we think about evaluating our clean energy and climate policy. And it's something that is serving as a basis now for a lot of conversations with uh, officials in the executive branch because they now have the fun job of trying to implement uh, this law. And I'll make a couple comments about that in some of the recent conversations we've had uh, through the course of these opening remarks. So um, first, when we think about sort of the policy context, you know, we've got really sort of two major climate bills, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Some also would believe that the Chips and Science Act is a sort of a third climate bill. And there is a, actually a lot in there that I think supports uh, investment in new technologies related to clean energy, although there, that is much more of sort of new authorizations as opposed to appropriated spending and uh, uh, extended tax provisions and modified tax provisions that will actually uh, uh, finance the deployment of new technologies going forward. But we're not alone. The Europeans have their Green Deal where they have talked about uh, likewise spending hundreds of billions of euros to support clean energy development. And even the term uh, uh, Build Back Better was originally coined by the UK uh, when talking about ways in which they wanted to think about the sort of post-COVID economic recovery that would be greener in its implementation. Now, when we look at some of the estimates out there about what we need to do in terms of investment, uh, to deliver on long-term climate goals, like limiting warming to two degrees C, we might be looking at something on the order of several trillion dollars a year by the year 2030 globally. So while the Inflation Reduction Act is an unprecedented sum in terms of US policy of spending on clean energy on the order of about three, 370 billion over 10 years, roughly 40 billion a year, it is gonna just be part of the challenge, that if we're gonna be up to the challenge, Part of what we need to do in terms of leveraging public sector and private sector monies to uh, promote and accelerate uh, decarbonization. Um, so the question though is, how do we know if we're building back better? And that's what's really sort of motivating this, that you know, as big as this bill is, we know it's not going to get us, in fact, the modeling now su suggested we're not gonna get to the President Biden's goal of having US emissions economy-wide by 2030. It's not gonna decarbonize the power sector as he's called for by 2035. It's not gonna be enough to get us to net zero by 2050. So we know we're gonna need more policy actions if we're gonna realize those kinds of goals. It'd be great if we can figure out from the spending here and spending both, when I use the term spending, I include both grant programs and various kinds of public programs that explicitly spend money, but also anything that goes to the tax code that subsidize investment through tax expenditures, I think the spending as well. How do we know what is really working well um, that we wanna continue or build on and some things which are not working as well that we may want uh, to reform? So when we think about this, I'm gonna provide a brief overview of the Inflation Reduction Act. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about why there's value in conducting these evaluations. I, I hope this is sort of music to the ears of a Kennedy School audience. Uh, but I think it's something that is, is really important sometimes to, uh, for a policy community that feels like, well, we've already got the bill signed. We don't need to worry about this. We've just gotta start implementing all these programs. And I think there are opportunities and value in conducting evaluation and planning for that evaluation as we begin to implement these programs. I then want to sort of draw on sort of two uh, case studies. One briefly about how we have in the past institutionalized evaluation. And I'll talk about some of the lessons from how the federal government conducts regulatory review and how they can actually inform an effort moving forward for how you want to institutionalize evaluation of clean energy spending. And then I'm going to talk about some uh, a case study about how we have conducted evaluations. And here I'll be drawing from the lessons from the academic literature that has conducted ex post performance evaluations of an array of clean energy programs that were funded in the 2009 Recovery Act, the major economic stimulus bill passed early uh, in 2009. I'll then talk a little bit about some guidance for how we might plan for these evaluations moving forward and then close with a couple of comments on policy implications. So first, uh, an overview of the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, it's part of this major challenge, which is how do we go from what have been historically growth in emissions, this is globally, um, but how we've had sort of globally growth in emissions, how if we don't do anything on climate change, we'd expect if we look at the orange line, our emissions to continue to grow. But if we're gonna actually deliver on the goals uh, that leaders agreed to say in Paris in 2015, as a part of the UN climate talks, we need to do something more like that gray line. And it's that big gap that policy like the Inflation Reduction Act is trying to play a role in trying to close. But we have other policy objectives as well. And we see this in the Inflation Reduction Act and we've seen this in previous laws as well the various kinds of buy American or domestic content requirements, um, what in the past we called sort of Davis-Bacon Act requirements, 
Uh, some of what we see here are sort of in, in the Re Inflation Reduction Act are labor requirements, whether that you are able to demonstrate you're paying your workers a prevailing wage without occupation in your local market, whether you have apprenticeship programs as well, um, more and more concerns about how we think about environmental justice and some programs and some spending that are intended to target low income or underrepresented communities and questions about how we think about the sort of potential trade-offs with other environmental considerations, whether it's NEPA or Endangered Species Act, some of these issues that come up when we think about big infrastructure bill and how do we sort of navigate this when we know that we need to put out a lot of new uh, infrastructure that's focused on clean energy if we're gonna be able to realize these goals. And then there's kind of a complicated mix of politics. You know, we've been working on Build Back Better. Uh, you know, this bill that came together in August had either been worked on for about 18 months or 18 days, depending on your perspective of like when Senator Schumer and Manchin came up with a deal that somehow sort of navigates the politics enough to be able to move through the Senate under the terms of budget reconciliation in the US Congress. So a couple of elements of the Inflation Reduction Act that I'm gonna be focusing on, I'm gonna just mention these briefly, and these are, I think, think some themes that we'll probably return to over the course of this semester in this seminar. Um, so first is noting, yes, this is a lot of money, about 370 billion uh, of clean energy, and about 270 billion of that, um, so roughly three quarters, is through the tax code. So much more heavily uh, oriented towards the tax code than what we've typically done in the past. Um, and that has important implications for how we think about implementing uh, this policy and how we evaluate. A lot of the spending and a lot of the tax provisions have 10-year horizons. And in a few cases, we have something that phases out near term because they want to sort of accelerate and get a program up and running. In some cases, we see tax credits that phase out and transition to technology neutral tax credits, such as in the power sector. But it's a much longer time horizon, which gives them uh, those who are making investment much more predictability about the policy landscape that may enable greater uh, investment moving forward. Some of the simulation models, and we hear some of this from John Larson later in the semester, uh, suggest that we're probably cutting US economy-wide emissions by about 10 percentage points from what they would have been otherwise by the year 2030. So some of these key considerations. There is a lot more of a focus on what I would call industrial policy in this bill than what we've seen in the past. So there, in 2009, in the Recovery Act, we had a few Buy American provisions, but there's a lot here that um, increases, say, the value of a tax credit if you can demonstrate that uh, the good is made with uh, domestic content. So if you're uh, investing in a new wind farm, uh, do the wind turbines, are they manufactured with US steel? Um, do we see that the um, electric vehicles, the batteries, are they made with, uh, uh, are they manufactured here in the United States? Are the critical minerals either sourced from the United States or recycled in the United States or sourced by a country with which we have a free trade uh, agreement? So there's a lot more about how we're orienting the investment here. We also have some provisions that are giving additional bonuses for locating the new energy infrastructure in an energy community, which is a term that didn't exist before. It's very carefully it has very careful parameters uh, elaborated in the bill. Um, the short version of this is it'll include a bunch of uh, communities in West Virginia. So the idea there is to target some of the spending into uh, places that were traditionally fossil fuel uh, producers uh, to, to think about how you, you're gonna do this sort of energy transition um, that can create jobs in these communities where they'll see dwindling, dwindling employment in fossil fuels. I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the outcomes here may be uncertain. Um, and, you know, to give two quick examples from the Recovery Act of 2009, some of the tax expenditures we wound up spending a lot more on than what had been estimated at the time the law was passed. We spent a lot more through the tax code on wind farms and solar or through a grant program that developers of wind and solar could claim in lieu of the tax credits, a lot more than what had been projected by the Joint Committee on Taxation when they scored the bill. Um, tens of billions of dollars more. So it's not like a small error. It's, and part of that's because the cost of the technology came down a lot. And we learned how important it was to actually free up these developers from the constraints of the tax equity market, a point I'll get to again in just a moment. But then we had other programs. The Department of Energy's loan guarantee program only spent about $2 billion of its $6 billion original appropriation. High-speed rail had a lot of money. We don't go around in America on fast trains yet. Um, we're actually lucky to be going on kind of slow trains. Um, but, you know, so there's some programs that the technology doesn't plan, pan out. So there's institutional constraints on why these don't pan out. So we don't spend as much. So it's one thing to keep in mind, 370 billion is this kind of ex ante assessment. And it's another reason why there's value in ex post evaluation to really figure out where is the private sector making the most of these programs. 
Um, we're seeing some evolution towards technology neutrality. Traditionally, when we use the tax code, we're very specific about the technology, very specific about what industry it operates in. But there's three cases here where we're seeing a shift towards technology neutrality. First, the traditional tax credits, the production tax credit, the investment tax credit, and the power sector for renewables will transition to a, uh, a zero emissions technology neutral tax credit in just a few years. Uh, second, uh, we're seeing a, for the first time a hydrogen, uh, industrial hydrogen uh, production tax credit with the value of the tax credit will be a function of the carbon intensity of the hydrogen. So you've got, if you're so-called green hydrogen, you get a larger tax credit than if you're blue hydrogen, the difference between whether you're making it from renewable power or from natural gas. And we see in the context of methane emissions for the first time a fee, some people might call it a tax. It will apply on some of the methane emissions from oil and gas operations. It's a little bit complicated as a function of whether your emissions are above or below a specified uh, performance standard, and there will be uh, it interacts with what is a pending, what is currently a proposed regulation at EPA on methane emissions in this sector. But we're seeing more interest in this sort of technolo technology neutrality in the design of these policies. We have in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, for the power sector transferable credits and so-called direct pay. So the issue here has been, and this is something that we had to deal with back in the Recovery Act of 2009, is that if you're a wind farm developer or a solar developer, you often didn't have enough tax liability to fully monetize the tax credits. You know, if you're sitting on a, enough wind farm output where you say, hey, I should be able to claim $10 million of uh, credits through the production tax credit, but you don't owe the government at least $10 million in taxes, there's no way for you to fully uh, take on that value and monetize what we say is monetize it. So what we've seen in practice is that a wind farm developer would enter into a financial relationship with, say, back then, uh, firms like um, uh, Lehman Brothers, um, Bear Stearns, um, AIG, uh, Merrill Lynch. Some of these ring a bell in history because you're like, oh, some of these don't exist anymore. Um, and it was a big problem back then that at the, at, with a financial uh, crisis of 2008, you really had this sort of so-called tax equity market dry up. And so even extending tax credits didn't really value, wasn't all that valuable. So instead we gave this option that you can claim a grant in lieu of a tax credit, which is effectively what direct pay is now. Um, in the end, direct pay did not apply to everybody uh, in, who's, who's eligible for the PTC and ITC. In fact, uh, what we've seen now instead is uh, Congress decided to make these tax credits transferable. And this is one of the things that I, it'd be interesting to see how this new market where say a wind farm developer can sell a tax credit to someone else, how that's gonna operate and what kind of information will the IRS collect to try to reduce fraud in this market, but also what we might see, I think, as this market evolves, where you try to provide some transparency so that it, the market ends up being fairly efficient and, and robust. Direct pay is a little bit of a wrinkle, and it's gonna be a wrinkle for the folks at IRS, because the only firms that are eligible for direct pay are actually firms that are not taxpayers. So it's like being a municipal power company, like what Bill and I have in our hometown of Belmont. Uh, traditionally could not claim the PTC or the ITC. They can claim it in value, but they actually get paid directly because they don't actually file taxes. Or a, co -op, a rural co-op would fall into this category as well. So the IRS is figuring out how they're going to implement that. And finally, there's going to be a lot about how we do the implementation, what data do we need to collect, um, how we're going to define uh, some of the terms that are in the law. So there'll be some effort as the IRS develops guidance, in some cases rules, there's a lot that's going on here. I've had a number of conversations with Treasury staff over the last few, few weeks thinking about these issues and thinking about what kind of data they collect. You know, when we see the ITC claimed in, the ta in tax forms, all we know is the total value of investment that taxpayer is claiming. That taxpayer could be JP Morgan because they may be a financial partner with a bunch of solar developers. And so we know JP Morgan is filing their taxes. They're probably filing them with an address of New York City. We're pretty confident almost none, if zero, if any, of what they're actually financing is in New York City. And we just know the total dollar amount they're claiming for the tax credit. So if we're going to really try to assess how much we're driving investment, where we're driving investment, we want to understand who's enjoying the benefits locally when we're starting to substitute in clean energy for existing fossil fuels, which is really important when we think about uh, the interest in Justice 40 and the distributional consequences of our clean energy agenda, we're going to need to have and collect more granular data. And so Treasury and IRS staff are trying to think through ways they can do that without excessively burdening uh, taxpayers. Um, but there's a lot in those details that are going to matter for how we can learn where the clean energy program is really driving changes through the tax code. So with that, let me talk briefly about 
what are sort of the big picture benefits for why uh, that we derive from clean energy uh, policy uh, evaluation. First, it's nice to be able to show if something's working. So being able to demonstrate the efficacy of the policy, are we actually making progress towards the goals uh, that the administration has laid out? Um, how do we understand the distribution of the impacts? Um, who's benefiting, who's bearing some of the costs? Um, you know, what are some of the impacts that we might think of as being ancillary, but quite important? You know, this uh, program is focusing on clean energy, but some of the most important local impacts are gonna be improvement in public health as we start to drive out internal combustion engines with EVs, as we start to drive out uh, fossil sources of power with uh, renewable sources of power, et cetera. So being able to say, uh, you know, who uh, are enjoying the benefits and who is bearing the costs is gonna be very important in addition to just how much are we reducing overall emissions in the economy. It's gonna be important too to think through policy cost effectiveness. We don't have an unlimited budget to keep spending on these programs. It says something that this was actually part of technically a deficit reduction bill. So it's not clear to me how the politics work out if you didn't have certain provisions in the 2017 tax law that Senator Manchin and other Democrats wanted to eliminate, that actually gave them revenues that they can then dedicate to other spending, whether it's the clean energy provisions in this law or some of the uh, Obamacare provisions in this law. Um, so going forward, we're gonna need to be able to show, I think politically, as well as I think there's a lot of value from the policy standpoint, is you know, where are we getting the biggest bang for the buck? You know, what programs are minimizing the dollars for a ton of CO2 that we're reducing or for a, a value of benefit that we're delivering? And there's also going to be other socially and politically desirable metrics that people are going to care about, whether it's sort of job creation, uh, whether it's thinking about sort of the implications for just transition, where you think about impacts in specific regions, et cetera. So I think there's a lot that's going to be important to be able to sort of demonstrate what are the outcomes from spending these resources. Second, we're going to need to continue to implement climate policy and be nice if we can actually update policy with evidence that we draw from um, this policy practice. So it's so sort of an act, learn, act approach. Uh, to policy. So we're acting now, we can conduct evaluations to figure out what works well and use that for the next round of policy action. So it's also important that we recognize there's going to be a lot, I think, of sort of the iterative nature of clean energy policy. There will be future spending bills. There will be future opportunities through regulations under existing statutory authorities. We review fuel economy standards regularly. We review air quality standards at EPA and the Clean Air Act regularly. We review appliance standards at the Department of Energy regularly. So this sort of iterative approach to regulation gives those sort of natural uh, points in time for you to look back, learn, and update uh, your policy in light of that evidence. And then finally, I think it's important to think of how this can fit within a sort of a broader approach to basing policy on evidence uh, that is uh, drawing from the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2018. So through this act, it was actually passed in the very last day of that Congress. Um, and as a part of that, there was this push for uh, learning agendas. Uh, so the idea that every department in the government ought to develop a learning agenda and think about how it's going to integrate program evaluation as a part of that learning agenda. And I think one thing that's important is that climate change is one of those few issues that really spans almost the entirety of the federal government. And so it makes sense to think about how you can make climate and clean energy a key element of learning agendas across the federal government. Think about ways in which you can make that uh, something where agencies can learn from each other. You can think about ways in which you're going to develop common metrics for performance evaluation across the federal government and have it feed up through each of the performance evaluation frameworks that go into department specific learning agendas. So I think there's ways we can sort of institutionalize through this program evaluation uh, learning agendas for climate. And in the end, that's going to sort of inform how these agencies move forward with their strategic planning, their annual budget planning, how they communicate to Congress, how they're actually making progress on the climate goals that are relevant to their department or, or agency. So let me turn now to briefly some lessons from regulatory review uh, for how we could institutionalize the uh, institutionalized evaluation. So first, um, when we look at, the, it's, it goes back to 1993, there's an executive order uh, from the Clinton administration. It replaces an executive order that was first uh, issued in 1981 by President Reagan on the conduct and organization of regulatory review in the federal government. And part of it is tr trying to sort of uh, make it clear that every regulatory agency, when they come forward with a regulation, they need to be able to make the case to demonstrate that there's a compelling need for the regulation. 
And so they often talk about why there's some kind of market failure. Market failure is that when we sort of hear about the description in the executive order, you feel like, yeah, climate change definitely fits, the, uh, uh, fits this. Uh, so the thing is that when we're doing this, we, we make this sort of case for why we're not doing enough, why the private sector and the, and the markets as they currently function aren't doing enough to deliver on something that we think may be socially valuable um, because of adverse externalities, perhaps for public good problems with respect uh, to innovation, et cetera. And that's why there's this argument for uh, the regulatory intervention. Uh, and then they go forward and then that serves as the basis for why they then conduct a regulatory impact analysis to be able to demonstrate that what are the benefits, what are the costs, why this regulatory intervention will actually address that market failure and hopefully make uh, uh, the whole of the economy more, better off and the whole of Americans who enjoy the benefits from that economy better off than they would in the absence of that regulation. The entire reasoning laid on that executive order for why you do a regulatory intervention applies just as well for why you would spend on clean energy or use a tax code on for clean energy. And in effect, we could think about these as part of what this administration has called for actually on day one, back in January of 2021, for modernizing regulatory review. I think we ought to be a little bit more open-minded and not just focus on what is specifically a regulation promulgated under existing statutory authorities, but regularize, recognize that there are policy instruments that have the same effect as regulations, but operate through the tax code or, or through spending. You know, so a few years ago, we invested in a, uh, an energy efficient gas furnace at our old house. We actually were able to claim a uh, credit through the tax code. There are some states at the time, not Massachusetts, but there's some states that would actually provide a rebate program through spending. And that uh, appliance, that, that furnace was actually subject to an energy efficient standard at the Department of Energy. So there's a lot of investment that is already covered by regulations, spending, and the tax code. So I think it's just a sort of natural for us to think about uh, why, if we're going to conduct analysis on the regulatory approaches, that we should do so as well on spending and tax approaches. I think that's really important about why regulatory review, I think, has worked fairly well. Um, there is a, a clearly a culture uh, in the White House and throughout the major regulatory agencies for the conduct of these, how they use the regulatory review process to inform the design of a regulation and improve it as it goes through the process from proposal to final. Um, how we're able to sort of communicate in a fairly transparent way to stakeholders, the public, policymakers, what are the benefits and costs and the impacts of these regulations. It's because we have very clear guidance. We have guidance from the Office of Management and Budget that's common across regulatory agencies, but we also have regulatory agencies that have developed peer-reviewed guidance that have uh, served as the basis for how they conduct these regulatory impact analyses over the years. So I think that kind of approach, being able to have sort of standardized guidance on the methods and the process will be important for building out a culture and making it a norm for how we will evaluate the performance of clean energy spending under the Inflation Reduction Act. And finally, I think the way we do regulatory review, again, fits within this kind of iterative approach to policy that's gonna be important as we move forward with our climate policy agenda. There have been efforts to try to conduct retrospective analyses of regulations. Within the federal government, I would say it's a, at best a mixed record. We're, we've seen a lot more that's conducted in, uh, in the academy, and some of that is what I want to draw from and discuss in the context of the next, uh, the next part of the presentation. So one is, how do we think about institutionalizing evaluation, and how do you make that part of regular process in the federal government? But it's really important to think of creatively about how we're going to conduct those evaluations and to be able to draw from a lot of the lessons from the academic literature and how they evaluated uh, the Recovery Act of 2009. Now, I was involved in uh, the implementation of the Recovery Act when I was in the government, and there were a lot of conversations we had among economic agencies in the White House with various agencies about, like, can you implement your program in a way so that we can really learn from it? And we had a bit of a, a tension there because not only did we want to implement programs to reduce emissions and advance clean energy deployment, but because it was part of an economic stimulus package at a time when we were suffering the worst economy since the Great Depression, Unfortunately, we've since, of course, suffered a major shock in 2020. Uh, but at the time, it was the worst recession since uh, the 1930s. There was a view that we had to move out the money as quickly as possible. And so there was a concern that anything you would do in trying to think creatively about how you're going to implement and design a program to enable learning might slow down the rollout of resources. So there wasn't a lot of this done within the federal government, but there was a lot done by academics. So we sort of think about some of this as, you know, first, we need to think about how you could generate the data. And there was in the Recovery Act a lot of data reporting, 
but it wasn't actually what you really need for conducting analysis. So um, I'll get to an example of this in a few minutes when I talk about an energy efficient appliance rebate program. And in general, what we tend to find is that the government uh, agencies, when they assess their own programs, they typically suffered various biases where they're not really estimating the causal impacts of their programs. Instead, we saw a lot more of what I would say sort of measuring inputs, like how many program participants did we have? How much money did we actually spend? And then maybe at best then taking those estimates and applying some engineering based calculation to say, here's what we think the reduction in emissions or the reduction in energy consumption would be. And that does suffer from some biases as I'll note in a moment. So the thing is like, we've seen incredible rollout in solar capacity over the past decade. So basically solar capacity in the United States is, has increased by more than a hundred fold since the recovery act. And so the question is how do we attribute this growth to policy versus say, just exogenous, uh, if you will, sort of exogenous to policy changes in the market. And so the question is, it could have been the major extension of the investment tax credit in 2008. It could have been the option to claim Section 7, 1603 grants in lieu of the tax credits in the Recovery Act. It could have been accelerated depreciation for these projects that were actually uh, in the 1986 tax reform. It could be that there were loan guarantees also in the Recovery Act that went to some of these solar projects. It could be that we have a bunch of states have renewable portfolio standards. Some of them have a carve out that makes uh, the subsidy, implicit subsidy in the renewable portfolio standard more generous for solar, or the fact that we're putting a price on carbon on those fossil fuel sources of electricity that these solar units compete with in their market. Could be because of net metering. We don't know. Um, could be federal R&D spending. That's actually upstream of any of these deployment subsidies. So the thing is we've seen tremendous growth, but it's really hard to say which of these policies or which combination of policies were most effective at driving out uh, a solar deployment. So um, it may even have been because of German subsidies uh, a decade earlier or Chinese subsidies on, on the supply side. So it may even be because of policies outside the United States. When we think about uh, projects that claim the loan guarantee uh, at the Department of Energy through the Section 1705 program creating the Recovery Act, so this is a list of every project that claims uh, the loan guarantee. They're all eligible for various kinds of tax subsidies as well, um, whether it is the production tax credit, the investment tax credit. If they're a manufacturing facility, they claim the clean energy manufacturing tax credit. There's a couple of biorefineries that took advantage of programs at USDA. They can take advantage of accelerated depreciation. They're also taking advantage of various state tax credits in some cases. And there's various regulatory uh, policies that also create additional demand uh, for these. So there's a lot going on here. If you were to go to the DOE website, it reads as if every single one of these projects would not have happened in the absence of the 1705 program. That may be true for some of these. I don't know. It seems hard to imagine that they were eligible for all these other programs and none of those were going to be sufficient. And then a loan guarantee program comes in and that is the, the, the determining factor, the marginal uh, policy for driving out this investment. So I think there's some key lessons uh, at, at risk of sounding like um, API 201 and 202 uh, for the MPPs about wh where we can draw lessons from the causal inference literature. You know, uh, last year, um, the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, was effectively awarded for the contributions to causal inference. And they noted that effectively natural experiments help answer important questions for society. And I think that's certainly the case here. We could go forward with field experiments through randomized control trials. And I'll talk about a variant of that in a moment. Um, but a lot of times we're also going to be trying to exploit variation through natural experiments in a way that sort of mimics what you would see in a randomized control trial. And so it sort of looks like sort of the clinical trials that we're all familiar with with respect to, to vaccines. Um, but they're not like randomized control trials. We're going to be trying to find some variation um, that's going to allow us to say something credible about the causal impacts of the policy. And that's how we're going to learn what, how the, you know, what outcomes are actually caused by these clean energy programs. So to go through uh, four examples quickly. One is how we can think about learning from randomization. Um, so there's a really nice paper about the weatherization assistance program. Um, and the reason why there's value in having a randomized control trial is because there's a kind of conventional bias in how uh, the Department of Energy has sort of estimated the benefits from the weatherization program. They work with engineers at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. They develop a very sophisticated engineering model, but it doesn't have some of the behavioral responses that we think may be important uh, to account for. And so they're looking at just how many homes did we weatherize and multiply it by an outcome that comes out of an engineering model about what the energy savings are. 
uh, associated with a weatherization project. So uh, Meredith Fowley, um, uh, Michael Greenstone, and Catherine Wolfram did a nice field experiment. And they actually confronted a fundamental challenge we have when thinking about, say, a randomized control trial. When you talk to people who are actually running these programs or politicians who oversee these programs, which is to say, we don't want to make this program random. The whole point of this is to help low-income households reduce the energy consumption by investing in insulation and better windows, et cetera, in their house. So instead of saying we're gonna to try to change the rules, which would require even changing the law, so some low-income households would be eligible and some wouldn't, instead, they were clever and they said, we have scarce resources for how we market this program. So why don't we be strategic in how we market this program? And we're gonna randomize who among the eligible population is going to get special information and technical assistance for how to apply for this program. So they did that and they, so what they called sort of randomized encouragement. So no one's eligibility has changed, but some of the eligible receive a lot more information and a lot more guidance on how to apply for it than others. And they see that change in information does have a material impact on who is likely to apply for the program. They find what I still think is fairly significant reduction in energy, a reduction in energy consumption of 10 to 20%. It ends up being only about a third of what had been estimated out of the engineering models. And so one thing that's important is this then spurred a lot more research. Why are we falling so far short? And they were able to look, they had data on you know, household specific energy consumption. There's been a concern about some of this could be a rebound effect. They see a little bit of that. But what they found and then what's been built on, there's a nice paper by Christensen et al in the Review of Economics and Statistics that looked at another program. Part of the problem here is the model is too optimistic that the engineers used. Part of it is that the model is too optimistic about how good the contractors are. Now, some of you, if you've ever worked with contractors before, you know there's, let's say, variation in quality of contractors. And so as it turns out, some of the weatherization contractors are just trying to go through these projects really quickly. And you could actually see that a big reduction, a big uh, share when they decompose this gap between engineering and economically estimated energy consumption, energy savings, a big fraction of that gap is just variation in contractor quality. Um, some of it is rebound. Some of it is, it's costing less now to heat my home. I'm gonna turn the thermostat up a little higher now that I've weatherized the home. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's spawned additional research in this literature that's really important for us to understand how much this will benefit those households who go forward with a weatherization project. Now, when we think about applying randomization to, I'll just call it build back better as sort of a catch all for both the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, one, I think in general, we can strategically use our scarce resources for how we publicize our programs. Um, so some of it, there's a USDA Rural Energy for America program. Um, so you may, this is providing a lot of technical assistance to farmers and ranchers. You might try to be strategic in how you target them and see how much you can learn about the efficacy of that program by exploiting that randomization. EPA has for the first time a greenhouse gas reduction fund. There may be opportunities to think about how you can use that fund to educate the public about various kinds of tax credits. The IRS doesn't have any money for marketing tax credits. Now, some of these tax credits, the private sector has an incentive to market for you. I assure you, if anyone who's selling energy efficient windows, now that uh, we have tax credits for residential windows that are much more generous now than under the old law, they will start marketing it on behalf of the IRS because they want to sell more than energy efficient windows. Uh, but there may be ways in which we can use this EPA program to complement what's going on in the tax code and try to maximize the value and the take up of certain clean energy provisions in the tax code. And so we're able to sort of think about also ways in which we could mirror or not mirror, but uh, uh, build on some of these uh, technology deployment that will enable policy reforms. So there's also a recent study that's looked at the impacts uh, once you've subsidized through the Recovery Act smart meters for what role real-time pricing will have in changes in electricity consumption behavior. So we can also think about what comes next in policy that can build on uh, some of these technology deployments. Um, second, we can compare winners and losers. And the example here is a small business innovation research grant program. And so here's the potential bias, and this is to focus on an issue in sort of innovation uh, uh, policy. Um, typically, we can see who the government gives grants to, who's going to be undertaking some new innovative projects. It may be through ARPA-E uh, uh, that finances energy R&D programs. But in general, we see the winners of a grant competition, but not the losers. And the question is, some of those winners may have gone forward and innovated anyway, even without receiving the grant. And so just looking at what winners do doesn't really give us a good sense of what the alternative or the counterfactual would have been. 
Um, and so uh, Sabrina Howell, who was a doctoral student here for her job market paper, has a really nice paper looking at the Department of Energy's uh, SBIR program. Um, she was uh, very creative and persistent working with DOE to get their data on uh, hundreds of competitions where she got the data on the winners and the losers. And so she could use regression discontinuity methods to compare the outcomes of the lowest ranked winner in a given competition to the highest ranked loser. And they look really similar and she can go through sort of uh, reasons about how the program was implemented on why we think it's sort of plausibly random who wound up being the lowest ranked winner versus the highest ranked loser, but found that uh, the sort of phase one grants of this program increased patenting uh, by about 30%. And you can sort of see the RD chart there on the right here. It also increased, um, increasing the, in fact, by about 50% the likelihood that you're going to get subsequent venture capital money from the private sector to continue uh, conducting your R&D. Now, I think um, there are a lot of opportunities for how we can apply regression discontinuity to various Build Back Better programs. Basically, any competitive grant program, you could, you could do this with. And so you could think about this with the infrastructure bills, direct air capture hubs. Uh, there's an advanced industrial facilities deployment program under the Inflation Reduction Act. We've got hydrogen hubs. We've got a number of competitive programs that are going to put a lot of money into specific places that we could use to try to evaluate this. There's a section 48C clean energy manufacturing tax credit, which is the most bizarre tax credit I think I've ever seen simply because it's a competitive grant program, but we call it a tax credit. There's a cap, unlike all these other tax credits that are in the law, there's a cap on how much money can go out through this and you have to apply up front, and you go through a competitive process. There's $10 billion of it in this law. There was a little bit over 2 billion of this in the Recovery Act of 2009. But again, I think there's opportunities here for how they implement this to compare winners and losers to assess what impact this has on manufacturing and local economies. Um, there are also some programs that are intended to target low-income communities uh, and energy communities. And you might be able to sort of compare outcomes in communities that just qualify as an energy community or just qualify on the population income threshold as a low-income community with communities that just miss qualifying on those thresholds and, and looking at the differences in outcomes on clean energy and then everything associated with clean energy might be useful for learning the impacts of these targeting efforts. Um, third, we can exploit state variation. And this is using the sort of the traditional difference in difference uh, tool in uh, evaluating programs. I'll talk about the cash for appliances program. This is a program um, that Sebastian Hood and I evaluated uh, from the Recovery Act. The sort of typical bias here is that when DOE looks at the value of this program, they're counting up the number of rebates that go to Energy Star rated appliances. And they're assuming that no one would have bought an Energy Star rated appliance in the absence of this program. Um, so they have about 1.7 million rebates and they just multiply it by what's the difference in electricity consumption, for example, of the refrigerator that you bought compared to what uh, would have stayed in your home if you'd not bought a new refrigerator. The challenge is at this time, uh, refrigerators that were eligible for the rebate, Energy Star rated refrigerators, were more than half the US market without the rebate, right? So that means you put out 100 rebates into this market, you know, if you go from 50% market share for Energy Star to 55% share Energy Star, probably 90 of those 100 rebates were claimed by someone who was going to buy an Energy Star rated refrigerator anyway. And in fact, that's what we found. Um, is that for refrigerators, the inframarginal take up was near 90%. Um, in addition, because of some technical details on how this program was implemented and how it keys off of minimum efficiency standards, we also saw people buy kind of, if you will, nicer refrigerators that tend to consume more energy. So there's more shifting to slightly larger refrigerators. You also saw people buying more refrigerators with like ice and water dispensers in the door. Um, which I recall from Steve Chu, former Secretary of Energy, the worst thing you can do for energy efficiency is drill a hole in the door and put in a nice water dispenser. Um, but I remember our, our, our colleague here, Larry Summers, said, but people love ice and water dispensers in the door. And it was really a nice, I think, contrast between energy efficiency and economic efficiency between two principles uh, in Obama's cab cabinet. Um, but you end up getting very small impacts on energy savings. And the chart on the right there is showing um, what is very short-term impacts on market share and on effective electricity savings um, for these rebates for refrigerators. One thing I'll say about the data being collected, we got the data on every single rebate that DOE, that the states implemented through DOE for this program. So we had 1.7 million observations. We knew the model number of every refrigerator. 
which meant we could actually go to the manufacturer and know the, for like a refrigerator with a high degree of precision, how much electricity that refrigerator is going to consume that. Year. But we soon realized these data aren't what we need. We're, we're only looking at who is participating in this program and claiming the rebate. We needed to have a credible counterfactual. And that's something that's going to be common across all these is that we need to be able to look at those who didn't participate in the program and why and understand what, what, how they're different. And that, uh, that, that's why in the end for our analysis, we went to a major retailer and we got five years of their appliance transactions. Um, this is Sears. There's a lot of appliance transactions in our data, but we're able to then use all the state programs with this major retailer's data to be able to see what's the impact of, of this rebate program. And I think that's one thing that's gonna be important uh, for the government as we move forward is being able to collect data, sometimes beyond just those who participate in the program, sometimes working with the private sector to collect data that can help us uh, evaluate these programs. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities, whether it's, um, we've seen this actually uh, in the past with Recovery Act money, but there's more money for diesel school bus and heavy duty vehicle retrofits uh, uh, to evaluate them through this framework. So there will be some state grants through the CPA Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund that could be used. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, state policies that are going to be enabled by um, IRA monies that get flow through and are, are uh, effectively delegated to the states that could be uh, analyzed through this framework. Um, finally, we can think about exploiting formulas. And there's a lot, especially in the infrastructure bill, that allocates money to the states through formulas. And we can understand what impact that's going to have. And the, and the challenge is sometimes if we don't use these formulas, we're going to be um, taking advantage of a variation that may be highly correlated with what we care about. Like the big example in the Recovery Act is some of the places where we spent the most money in the Recovery Act were the places that had the highest level of unemployment. And if you're trying to understand what impact does Recovery Act spending have on employment, you might actually get, in effect, kind of the wrong sign. You see spending in high unemployment areas, uh, and you see less spending in low unemployment areas, which is kind of what you want if you're trying to target those who are worse hit by the recession, but it might look like spending causes unemployment if you're not careful about your statistical model. And so we've seen in the past efforts to try to evaluate, um, uh, David Popp and colleagues evaluated clean energy spending in the Recovery Act. There's also other programs that have looked at transportation spending in the Recovery Act um, and estimate sort of what's the sort of job creation from clean energy spending. And they found about 15 jobs created for every million dollars of spending. But there's a lot of what's in this law, uh, in these laws that focus on formula-based programs, and you can exploit those formulas so you have a credible um, a, a exogenous source of variation in where the money is going in order to estimate the employment impacts. So let me close with a couple of comments about how we can plan for clean energy policy evaluations and then uh, take uh, questions and comments for the last 15 minutes. Um, so when we think about some of the guidance for planning first, there'll be a lot of value starting at the top. And to say this, OMB has already started this in the context of learning agendas. They have a new website called evaluation.gov um, where they're really trying to get agencies to really adopt more and more of this mindset and to implement uh, within their institutions this framework for how to look. And so there's a lot here that I think in the context of clean energy and climate where from the White House, you can develop guidance and resources. That means actually appropriating monies to these agencies, making sure that they have the support for conducting these evaluations, um, as well as spurring these agencies to develop their own guidance. Because in some cases, there will be need for agency or department-specific guidance for conducting these evaluations. Second, um, it'll be important to identify the priority outcomes that you want to evaluate. Um, this is how you're going to help map what you evaluate to what are the priorities and, and, and the, the strategic focus for your department going forward in the clean energy and climate context. It's also a way to make sure that you're evaluating stuff that's most important gets, when we think about sort of the value of information, you wanna focus on those things that really do matter uh, for the administration and for your department. You wanna identify those policies and programs with the most learning potential. When we do regulatory review, we typically focus on just the largest regulations in terms of the economic impacts. We think there's probably the largest economic value associated with how we assess those larger regulations. That threshold is $100 million of annual impact. We're talking about spending programs here that are in the billions of dollars a year. They're way above. In the con compared to like, what are the economic impacts with regulations? They are on par with the very largest regulations the government has promulgated over the last 20 years. Um, so we could find those that are very large. We might think there's a lot of value in learning if we're spending a lot of money. We may also want to focus on those programs that we think could give us some insights about similar design programs where there may be positive spillovers to other policies. Um, I think it's really important for us to develop evaluation plans and data protocols at the implementation stage. In fact, you could go out publicly and say, here's how we're going to evaluate this. 
in three years or five years time. Here's the data we need to collect. This is why we're collecting the data we're collecting. This is why we're doing business differently in the past. This is why we're actually gonna to need to like partner with the private sector or partner with other government agencies and get data on non-participants so that we have the, the data that it will serve as the basis for a credible counterfactual. I think there's really a lot of importance in, in how we ensure the transparency of this, both going public with the plans, getting public comment on it, but also making a lot of the data and the analysis eventually available to the public. I think there's a lot of value in doing that to enable our students to then play around with these data and maybe modify how you do the analysis to think about what could be ways you could tweak the program in a way so that it could be more effective over time. And finally, it's important, I think, to promote a performance evaluation culture so that agencies see that there's a lot of value to doing this. This isn't just sort of another thing you have to check the box on, but you see how it actually is informing decisions being made at the highest level of leadership within the department, the highest level of leadership within the White House. You can see about how it is uh, informing the way the executive engages with the legislative branch on future policy. Maybe it's something where you start to take the outputs uh, of these evaluations, go into regular reporting to Congress. You could even imagine a scorecard, sort of a climate learning agenda scorecard across the federal government where you're compiling all the evaluation outcomes across these agencies. And each year it goes up to Congress and someone in the executive branch, or maybe several people from the executive branch have the joy of then testifying before Congress on the basis of the scorecard. Those kinds of commitments on political leadership ensures that they start to press that this work is being done, that it's done well, and that it has the resources to be conducted. And then you start to attract more and more future workers into the federal government who have the skills and the interests to help conduct these evaluations. So to close on some of the policy implications, one, I think you know, producing this evidence is gonna be critical so that we have more effective clean energy and climate policy over time. It will inform perhaps how we might design a carbon border adjustment. Uh, there's been some discussions in Congress about how this kind of evaluation could allow us to understand what effectively could be the shadow price, positive or negative on uh, the shadow of, of, of carbon. The shadow regulatory costs might be positive if we think about sort of EPA or transportation regulations. That shadow price might be negative. We think about a lot of these subsidies and tax expenditures. Um, all that would feed into what is an emerging debate internationally about how we might apply tariffs on the carbon content of goods imported in the United States. Um, the Paris Agreement has a provision for countries to report uh, the so-called transparency mechanism under Article 13. A lot of this information could be inputs into how the US government does its periodic reporting on uh, its progress towards meeting its uh, emission goals under the Paris Agreement. And you might be able to take your policy successes and export them to other countries and make it easier for them to deliver on their goals uh, to cut emissions and help us make more progress overall globally on this. So with that, let me wrap up. Um, Bill, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks to everybody as well and look forward to any questions and comments you have. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ketan Ahuja and I work on green growth for the Growth Lab. Um, I was wondering, are there any risks of becoming maybe overzealous identification police for any of this? Because, um, so for example, I used to work at the Department of Energy and your SBIR grant research, it's all very good, but you know, uh, you don't actually need to do that research to know that venture capitalists fund SBIR companies because all you need to do is talk to the venture capitalists who normally use SBIR as a signal for what to fund. Um, and um, all of your DOE loan program um, grants. Um, yeah, sure, there are lots of different programs, but um, in the broad scheme, maybe you miss the forest for the trees by looking at kind of, is the loan program marginal in any given case? Because actually nobody knows that, you know, um, there are huge swathes of risks, some are technology risks, you know, the loan program funded Solyndra and it also funded Tesla. Um, and so you don't actually know what the private sector is necessarily going to fund ex ante. Um, and the broader kind of thrust of industrial policy is just sort of doesn't have that degree of accuracy necessarily. So I have to admit, I get very nervous when someone says, let's just go talk to people and we'll, we'll know. Um, because we tend to have, we tend to suffer from some biases on who we go and talk to. And I think those biases will change. And in fact, I would argue they probably change quite significantly from one administration to the next. And so what we end up then is something that I don't think is all that transparent. 
I think we have something which uh, we end up finding, uh, I think uh, results of such consultations will be subject to confirmation bias. And I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do a program if we can't causally identify it. But what I would suggest is that it's clear we haven't been doing enough. And it's clear that there are actually strong bureaucratic reasons to sometimes make our programs look a little bit better than they really are. And so that's why I think there's a lot of value in trying to think through where are there opportunities. It's not clear to me that you could do the DOE loan guarantee program through one of these methods. It is a very complicated program. Um, I know a lot about that 1705 program. Uh, I had a coordinate review of that in the Obama White House. It was a challenging program to implement. Uh, but what I would say is given that we've got you know, $270 billion going through the tax code, that for the most part is not gonna be subject to the kind of political discretion that we see something like a loan guarantee program has, that I think is really ripe if we collect the right data to understand the impacts. I also think it's gonna be critical when we think about some of the, the, the sort of political motivation for this. The, the Biden administration has this ag aggressive goal, an ambitious goal, I should say, through the Justice 40 uh, initiative that 40% of the benefits should accrue to low income and underrepresented communities. There's not a lot in this bill that specifically targets those communities. By the nature of tax credits, most of them don't. Having said that, I think a lot of the tax credits will deliver benefits to these communities, but we're gonna to need to collect the data necessary to understand that. So I, I think, you know, to your point, yes, you can talk to some people on some of these programs, but I think for a lot of them, if it's going through the tax code, one thing we're technically not supposed to just go talk to taxpayers and say, did you claim this? Where part of this is a dance and part of what I'm doing work with folks at Treasury on is what data can they collect that's gonna enable IRS and Treasury staffs, perhaps in consultation with academics, to do the evaluation subject to uh, the appropriate data management, how some of the data may be available through secure data centers that academics would work with, uh, perhaps funded in projects funded by the federal government to help them think about the best tools for evaluating this. Um, but in a world in which we've done very little within the government on causal inference, and I've seen how the incentives result in a lot of cheerleading uh, in ways that I think are, um, um, do not represent anyone's sort of credible assessment of what the causal impacts of this policy are, um, basically assuming everybody's marginal. I think it's time for us to at least think hard and think through how we might be able to, to implement these in a way and collect the data in a way to say something a little bit more substantive about the impacts of these programs. Um, you mentioned, hi, I'm Kurt. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that one of the distinctive features of the IRA is this industrial policy kind of domestic content uh, piece. Um, it, it's that, that seems a little problematic because on one hand, that'll probably raise the price of um, mitigating a ton of carbon, right? Um, so it's less economic efficiency. And then on the other hand, from a measurement perspective, seems pretty difficult to draw a through line from, okay, we have this domestic content requirement, that's going to trace back to certain firms being advantaged, you know, that'll increase employment, right, in certain ways. So I'm just wondering how you, how we might think about evaluating the impact of those domestic content um, pieces. Right. So uh, it is a bit of a challenge. Um, in, in a sense, it, it's what happens when you have a tool, in this case, say, you know, pick your tool that's subject to these provisions, but the production tax credit um, for most renewables, the investment tax credit for wind, I mean, for solar, um, you've got a kind of emission reduction goal, but you also have this second sort of industrial policy and, and building out US manufacturing goal. So you're, you've got one instrument for two goals, you're not gonna be able to optimize on both. So you're right. In general, it, to the extent that the domestic content requirement or the labor requirements have any sort of uh, bite, um, that means you're probably having to spend more for a time that you reduce. Now, it may be something that you've decided for supply chain reasons. I think we've got this greater anxiety about um, how long a supply chain is uh, um, uh, after the last few years. Um, that, that may be one argument one makes. Um, I, I think it's important to try to think through some of the evidence on that. Uh, but there's also clearly this view that like, in order to get the political support, we're gonna say we're gonna be doing a lot for domestic uh, manufacturing. Um, I think this does make the evaluation process more difficult. Um, I think part of it is, is trying to assess, are there gonna be some differences? You know, there's different parts of the country that where it may be harder or easier to comply with these provisions, right? So it may be, um, uh, you know, say domestic content and you're a wind uh, farm, 
are you close to an already operating facility that manufactures turbines or not? Because moving a turbine across land is really difficult and expensive. Um, so it may be that we could think about some places that are really close to manufacturing facilities, it'd be easy for them to comply with, and others where it may be more difficult. And we might get a sense of just how, in the near term, how easy or hard is it to comply with that provision um, based on the existing geography of good wind and manufacturing facilities. Um, we may be able to exploit differences in sort of where labor markets are um, and where we have existing apprenticeship programs, because that's, that, that's worth two cents a kilowatt hour in the production tax credit prevailing wage, demonstrating your meat satisfying local market prevailing wage and having an apprenticeship program. Some parts of the country, they might already have that. Other places may take a little time to ramp that up. Again, that, that, that allows us to take a, you know, what is a universally applied tax credit, but recognizing it's, it is easier to, to satisfy it in some places versus others and exploit that variation in your analysis. Thanks for the presentation, Jeff. Uh, Alex Holoy from the Weather Care Center. Um, just I would like to know uh, the relation between the, the Inflation Reduction Act and the incertain of the greenhouses reduction, because you never mentioned nothing about that. And how, how much on greenhouses are you expecting with this kind of incertain to reduce for the future? What is the link of the act and NBC? And what is the link of this act with this global supply chain, because maybe you can be greener, but you are continuing importing raw materials from another kind of countries like Africa or South America with a higher carbon footprint. So how, how is the overlap between this act, NDC, right. your global commitment and raw materials? So on the NDC, um, I, I went over this very quickly in part because John Larson will go over this in a lot of detail in uh, November when he's in our seminar. Um, the, the sort of there's there were sort of three models that were doing sort of rapid uh, turnaround analysis of what became the Inflation Reduction Act, and they all said sort of ballpark. Without the act, we, our emissions in 2030 would be about 30 percent below 2005 levels, and with the act, would be in the ballpark about 40 percent below 2005 levels. So a little difference across them, but that sort of 30 to 40 percent uh, reduction. You're moving from 30 to 40 percent is about what we should expect. So you can think, you know, one way about it is the goal in the nationally determined contribution with the United States is a cut of at least 50% by 2030. So that gap before the Inflation Reduction Act, the current ex ante analysis suggests we could cut that gap in half. That means there's more work that needs to be done if you're going to deliver on the nationally determined contribution, but it makes it much more plausible that you might be able to do that, that you might think about layering on additional regulations, there may be subsequent uh, um, uh, legislation down the line, but this is like a really substantial foundation for getting you uh, for getting you there. On the issue about sort of supply chains on things like critical minerals, you know, the, the act is is really trying to focus um, for say for batteries that we'd be sourcing these critical minerals, either recycled in the U.S. or sourcing it from countries that we have free trade agreements with. So it starts to raise questions about whether or not we'd be sourcing, say, from African countries uh, since we don't have free trade agreements uh, with them. But that's part of how they're trying to think through this. I mean, there is this issue when we think about sort of the international relations and the diplomacy of this. There's some people who are kind of like, wait, you're going to just build a wall around the U.S. and try to build everything within the United States. You're not really helping. You know, we ought to all be working together. And some of us might have comparative advantage in making some of this stuff. Why don't you just buy some of that? And where you have comparative advantage in, you build, as opposed to trying to do everything within your country. And, and I think there is there are some potential tensions there about how the U.S. engages other countries, given the focus on domestic content and buy American in this bill. Hi, Lucas from the Growth Lab. Um, I was wondering what your comments are on the provisions in the IRA regarding um, federal lands that need to be offered to industry for oil and gas uh, production um, that were also entered in that kind of tension between that and then also lands that need or could be offered for renewable energies because there is some minimum requirement right that at least needs to be offered right. which then depends on demand from industry but what's your what's your view on that? Uh, I think this bill is less consequential for that than what's going to happen in the crazy oil and gas market the next five to 10 years. I mean, I, 
that when you, we look at the modeling analyses, you know, they, they have different scenarios. And the variation in the scenarios is really driven by variation in what's going to be the price of natural gas. Um, and it's a question about whether natural gas is going to be able to further displace more coal, if it's cheap, or if it ends up being higher than we expect. Like right now, natural gas is higher than we would have projected a year ago. Because um, I think a year ago, the markets weren't baking in, losing a lot of natural gas out of Russia going into Europe. And seeing now that there's such high LNG demand for US natural gas for us to export to, to Europe. So, uh, so I, I think when we look at the provisions, they are opening up more lands. They're also raising modestly uh, the royalty rates, uh, the minimum bid and leases. Um, so uh, Brian Prest will, will, will speak to this in detail. Um, he, he's gonna give us uh, an hour and 15 minutes on oil and gas. Uh, and I don't wanna steal his thunder, but my sense is this is relatively modest. Uh, and and how much more we take advantage of that is going to be, I think, driven by factors beyond the law, like just what's going to happen with um, natural gas prices more generally over the next few years. Well, I'll take take one more question, Bill. You're you're rusty and and, and keeping us under control and in check. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Anurag from the Belfer Center. Um, I was curious, um, this framing of randomized um, encouragement. So it does, uh, um, as you mentioned, it is very valuable to generate the counterfactual data to evaluate uh, policies. And I'm curious uh, if you scale this framing and try to apply it to multiple policies, like um, do you think it will uh, sustain from a political economy, public values questions? Like are people going to push back and be like the government is uh, selecting certain people or encouraging other people? Like how feasible is it to scale this across programs? So I think the key thing here is that um, randomized encouragement doesn't affect anybody's eligibility for the program. And what you're saying is simply, you know, we've got a scarce amount of money and we could just be kind of mindless in how we try to do advertising for this. Maybe we do, I don't know, an ad in newspapers and that's going to hit a very weird population because like, I don't know. I still get newspaper delivered, but I'm not. We're not. We're not the average demographic when it comes to newspapers anymore. Um, and so, you could also then be strategic in how you decide you're going to market this program. And before you started being strategic about it, everybody who's eligible has the same likelihood of being picked to receive this information. And I think that's that's kind of what's important. And, and you know, in a sense, the kind of ethics are the same here as like participating in a vaccine trial. Ex ante, you know that you have a specified percentage, depends on how many people are going to get treated with the vaccine versus how many are going to get the placebo. You don't know if you're getting it or not, ex ante, but you know the likelihood you're going to get it. And everybody has the same likelihood who's participating in that trial. So here, if you're going to be strategic, so long as you're truly randomizing, ex ante, everyone who's eligible has the same likelihood of getting this information and enjoying the benefits of having technical assistance to apply for a program or to take advantage of tax credit or what have you. So. I think one can make a credible argument that this is, you know, reasonable on, on sort of the ethics and the politics. We're not changing eligibility uh, in order to sort of learn from it. Um, and if anything, we're trying to be a little bit more strategic than what we typically are when we try to market uh, some of these clean energy programs. So perhaps I'm a little bit optimistic on this, uh, and some evidence will change my mind on this uh, as as we move forward. But I, I think one can make a credible argument on that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.